Good morning. My name is Eleanor Yick, Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Southwest Santa Clara Valley, which covers the cities of Los Gatos, Saratoga, Monteserino, Campbell, and a small segment of West San Jose. Welcome to this program that is being supported by all five leagues in Santa Clara County. Many of you attended part one of this two-part series that focused on election systems, security, and threats. Today, part two will provide both an overview of ranked choice voting and two actual simulations of ranked choice voting, which is viewed as an election system that will engage more voters and open up the election process. We are thrilled to have two outstanding speakers with us today, Celia Norton. Good morning, Celia. And Steve Chesson. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. They are going to inform us all about ranked choice voting, what it is, where it originated, where it is being used, problems and solutions, and then we will all participate in two actual simulations. While our guests are presenting, our audience members should feel free to enter any questions you may have into the chat located at the bottom of your screen. You simply click on it and type in your question. Marianne Shovlin and Lois Smallwood will be monitoring the chat and will select questions to be responded to our speakers. And now I would like to officially introduce our first keynote speaker today, Celia Nor Nolan. Celia is a senior national organizer with Rank the Vote, which is a 501c3 organization with a vision that the national adoption of ranked choice voting could create a political and social culture with elections based on competition of the best ideas rather than scorched earth politics and a government that is truly accountable to we the people. Ranked choice voting forces politicians to campaign on the issues rather than pandering to a voter block on sound bites. The mission of Rank the Vote is simple, help everyday people build robust movements for ranked choice voting in their own states. Their strategy is to harness and cultivate grassroots energy in every state, so movements emerged organically with activists who possess the knowledge, skills, and resources to get ranked choice voting into the law at the local and state levels. Currently, Rank the Vote is working in groups in more than half of all US states to build a nationwide movement to change our elections. And now I will turn it over to Celia Nolan. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor, so much. And thank you um, to the League of Women Voters of Santa Clara County. Uh, I want to mention I'm in actually Massachusetts at the moment, and I am a member of my local league, which is the League of Women Voters of Hingham, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm also organizational support for your local California organization, which is the California Ranch Choice Voting Coalition. Um, and the presentation you'll see today is adapted from that CalRCV presentation, so I would like to thank them for that. So as you heard, I'll be covering quite a lot of ground today. So this will be um, really a pretty quick survey. We can definitely send more information after this presentation with examples and statistics and sources. Um, but, uh, and you're also welcome to ask questions. We'll stop at a few points to have questions also. So let's talk about the first 200 years or a little bit more of ranked choice voting because that's what we have. And really the goal is to find a governing body that really does represent the electorate as we're entering um, the stage of democracies worldwide. So 1819 in England, Thomas Hill came up with an idea to elect a committee where people would vote. If someone got more votes than they needed, some ballots were selected out and those people could choose again. So this is sort of the beginning of this concept of a transferable vote, um, but it was not very systematic and hard to replicate um, as a large public election. Then in 1840, his son, Thomas Rowland Hill, went to Australia 
uh, and had, did have a small public election with the same concept, but people would vote one at a time. So once someone had enough votes, the next people would know that candidates elected, I can choose from the remaining pool of candidates. This means though, of course, that later voters have more information than the first voters, still not very equitable. Then in Denmark, Carl Andre used a similar system, but implementing ranked ballots where you could put your preference on a single ballot rather than stand in line and wait your turn. Um, and independently, at just about the same time, Thomas Hare in England uh, had the concept of eliminating the lowest vote getter and redistributing their next preference in order to find a winner which we call single transferable vote. And this is really the kernel of what we use today with more refinements. A next refinement, an important one was by Henry Droop, also in England, rather than picking a uh, sort of random winning number, he came up with a system based on the number of seats that were available rather than the number of people voting, which was used before or even more random concepts. Then in Massachusetts, we're up to 1871, William Robert Ware, who was an MIT professor and architect, architect, he adapted this concept for single winner races. It had been for multi-seat races up until this point. And Ware's uh, system is really what you're gonna be experiencing today and what's most familiar for single winners. <clears throat> Then an important enhancement uh, was made by J.B. Gregory in 1880. Uh, rather than having random votes redistributed, if you have excess votes, uh, he came up with a system to proportionately reallocate those votes. And this is really uh, what we use generally for proportional representation, ranked choice voting today. So that really is what we have. Of course, there are more refinements over time, uh, mostly um, academicians and political scientists just tweaking the formula to try to get it more perfect. But this is really uh, what we use today. And there are also other types of voting. So I won't be getting into the details today, um, but there are certainly more as people seek ways to gather more useful information and represent people. So it may be having multiple votes like an approval, it may be cumulative votes, um, it could be a score method, a range method, uh, comparing pairs, there's all sorts of concepts and I encourage you to look into them, it's really very interesting. But our focus today is ranked choice voting. Um, and as this says, there is no perfect system, but that doesn't stop us from exploring what might be out there. Uh, so where does that bring us today as far as use of rate choice voting? It has ebbed and flowed, uh, but as we look at it now, it's used in several countries um, and for over a hundred years in some cases. So these are, uh, the countries on the screen do use it for public elections um, at certain levels. Uh, it may be inter-party elections also or municipal elections in Canada, it's in two cities at the moment. Um, and there are other uh, countries that use it also, India, Pakistan, the Czech Republic, um, even Papua New Guinea uses ranked choice voting in some <laughs> In the US, uh, it has been used or passed in 29 states. And uh, I think it's interesting to look at this map. So the colored states use ranked choice voting at some level, could be municipal county, uh, it could be military and other overseas voters and some states use ranked choice voting. If there isn't enough time for runoff election ballots to be printed, sent overseas and mailed back, ranked choice voting can solve that problem. And as you see, it's a, nonpartisan issue and it's in states that we may think of as right-leaning or left-leaning. And it's not only used for public elections. Professional organizations use ranked choice voting. We have a few of them here. The Academy Awards choose their winners that way. And also colleges and universities um, use this. Party elections and conventions use it also. Um, 
and it's in, if I can remember my notes, it's used in 33 states at colleges and universities and about 87, um, and many of them in California. In fact, almost two and a half million California students use ranked choice voting in their student government elections and other uses every year. Hmm. And we're not done yet. Ranked choice voting is actually the fastest growing electoral reform in the nation. So we are organizing for it right now. That is my job. Um, that is the California Ranked Choice Voting Coalition's um, mission. And so as of now, if we're looking at the state level, there are two states that do use ranked choice voting in their elections. That's Maine as of 2016 and Alaska in 2020, which has certainly gotten a lot of coverage recently. Um, it will actually be used in 12 elections this November. And those purple states are the states where there is an active ranked choice voting movement or campaign that wow. we are aware of. Um, so there are only a few states left. And in fact, it will be on the ballot a record 10 places ballot initiatives this November, uh, 10 ballot initiatives in seven states, including Ojai, California, and the state of Nevada. So electoral change is you know, a serious topic to undertake. It has to be done carefully. So why is there this movement to change it? And why now? And why is ranked choice voting one of the solutions that we are proposing? So if you think about our current system, and by this I'm talking about one person, one vote, the highest vote getter wins, it's first past the post, you can win with far under 50% of the vote as long as everyone else gets fewer votes than you. So this is our current system. So if you think about it, what are what is happening with our system? What are the incentives and disincentives? So for politicians, all they have to do is get more votes. And it's easier to perhaps demonize another opponent demonize the supporters of another candidate rather than win people over. So this brings up negative campaigning, mudslinging, um, not working with the other side. It's not, it's gridlock that doesn't help our policies. And it discourages politicians from having courage generally, both to run for an election, if you're a new candidate, it's difficult to get the name recognition. You may be told to wait your turn, especially if you're a woman or a person of color, perhaps, or you know, representing a minority block. And it discourages courage to work with the other side. If you are seen as someone who crosses the aisle, then in your primary, it may be easy to attack you for that. And that leaves you vulnerable. And what about the voter experience? We have to be political scientists, really. We have to be political analysts and think, I know who I wanna vote for, but if they can't win, someone might win who's worse than my even second choice. So maybe I shouldn't vote for my favorite. Maybe I should. It's very complicated to vote the way we do now. And it does mean that voters may be voting against their conscience. This doesn't feel very good for most of our voters and many people may decide not to vote at all. So if we look, for example, at California, this is very high level. I believe this is from 2020, your assembly election. Um, so the colors are for the incumbents in office. Uh, as you see, it's Democrats and Republicans in large blocks. Republican voters in the blue areas are not represented. Democratic voters in the red areas are not represented. Independents and other parties are not represented at all. So really, it's little wonder that people are discouraged from voting, have the feeling that their votes don't count and it may not matter. And really their feelings in that are not unfounded. So we're looking for a real 
practical solution and ranked choice voting has many benefits. So when I talk about ranked choice voting, this is a ballot where you can rank candidates, put them first, second, third, as far as you want. And you'll experience this later. Um, but the effect of this is that there are no more spoilers. You can vote your conscience, votes aren't split because they will coalesce around a consensus candidate. The candidates that win have that consensus. They're more popular overall. And voters know that even if their first choice wasn't part of electing that person, perhaps a later vote was in fact contributory. Since now politicians have a reason to talk to a broader electorate, they'll focus on the issues. They'll try to win people over. Campaigns are more positive. That's the way you win under ranked choice voting. And if there are primary elections or runoff elections, these are quite expensive to run and have low turnout. Ranked choice voting can handle this in one ballot. And so it saves a lot of money. It encourages more people to run. There's more of a chance that a new candidate um, has the possibility of winning. Specifically candidates of color and women, there's no fear anymore that voting blocks may split. So voters have more choice in the candidates that will be on their ballots, and they have more voice to express who they want to represent them. And it's a way for politics really to work for all of us instead of small slices of us in certain areas. So no, no system is perfect, as I said. So since we have seen ranked choice voting in use for a while now, we have actually uh, you know, real data and we can see what people think of it and see how well it works. So New York City uh, is quite a diverse electorate. So it's an interesting case study and voters loved it. 87% of voters used rankings. They ranked more than one person. And remember, if you do vote for only one, that may be sincerely the only candidate that you, uh, that you like. 95% um, of New York City voters found ranked choice voting easy to use. This is from exit polling. And 77% wanted to use it again. And turnout was the highest since 1989. So, uh, you know, it was a competitive election, but there was an appetite to participate in this kind of an election. And, oops, I'll get back. In other areas, when ranked choice voting is adopted, we do see that increase in voter turnout. And importantly, there really is not um, a statistically you know, notable change in the number of votes uh, with errors on them. And for turnout and voting errors, it does not change in the demographics. So it really is a, a different system. People are educated, they use it, uh, without much difference in the voter errors. But what about election administrators? This is a change for them. So preliminary results for ranked choice voting can and should be released on election night, even though for RCV elections that don't have a majority winner in the first round, it may not be final. But election administrators can still release this information and give updates periodically. Uh, and since we have had so many ranked choice voting elections, um, there are experts in the field. Administrators have experienced it. There are resources available. There are educational materials, organizations that specialize it, and grassroots organizations like the California Ranked Choice Voting Coalition that have people that can go out and educate voters. And so really we have seen that the transition has been smooth. Um, and here in California, you've experienced that pretty recently with San Francisco and Alameda County and more coming, like Albany. Um, so I do wanna address some of the things we hear that may be arguments against ranked choice voting. And one is that the results may not be immediate. So what we see is often actually that delay is because of laws on mail-in ballots that you have to wait until they come in. And we wanna make sure that we've taken into account all the ballots. So uh, you can actually watch a video of Maine 
calculating a ranked choice voting election, it's a click of a button. So when the ballots are in, it's very quick. Um, and in the early elections, since it was a new system, there was a big focus on security and integrity. Um, that is, of course, crucial in our elections. Um, but now, as we're more used to this system, that is speeding up a bit. So that's being alleviated. Um, there is some concern that not all ballots may be counted in the final round. If people don't uh, rank all candidates or if there are very many candidates, this can happen. It's not very common actually. And as voters get more uh, accustomed to ranking their ballot and understanding how it works, that they cannot hurt their favorite by ranking more, we do see that people utilize more rankings and so this will become less prevalent over time. And people are always worried about strategic voting and how to game the system. Ranked choice voting is quite robust um, in this manner. Actually, right now, we need to predict who can win. It's very complex. Um, but with ranked choice voting, you don't need to strategize. You can rank your preference and not hurt your favorite as you do so. All right, so I'm going to stop here for a little pause. That's a lot of information. So we'll see if there are any questions in the chat. <laughs> no, not yet. I know this is a very educated crowd. So I wasn't I wasn't sure if you would have any uh, questions, but I'm happy to continue on if there really are not. I know Marie Ann, you might be scanning rapidly. No? Okay. I think we'll continue. Are there, are there, there's a couple coming in right now. Uh, are there uses in other country national elections? National elections, yes. Ireland uses it nationally. Australia does for one chamber, maybe one chamber only. Um, and actually, we have Steve Chesson, who is quite an expert in these things, too. Those are the two major examples I can think of. Uh, Steve, if you want to add on, feel free to jump in. Uh, yes, Australia uses both the single winner form for their house elections and they use the multi winner proportional form, which we'll be talking about later in their for their Senate elections. And that's at both at the national level and also state legislature level as well. Another question is, what is the spoiler effect in referencing the year 2000? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, so this is the 2000 presidential election, um, which we probably all remember. So the spoiler effect, usually the, the main example is Florida, uh, where there were votes for Al Gore, George Bush, and Ralph Nader. And the number of votes for Nader was greater than the difference between Bush and Gore. So the idea there is that if Nader voters had known, uh, oh, and also in exit polling, it seemed like most Nader voters would have voted for Al Gore. So conceptually, if Nader voters had known that by voting for Nader, they were essentially allowing George Bush to win with less than 50% of the vote, perhaps they would have voted differently. So this is the quandary. Do we want people to vote honestly and maybe get a result they're not happy with? Or do we want them to settle for that lesser of two evils and themselves avoid the spoiler effect? Or do we want to allow candidates to run and have a system that, uh, that still results in a way that the voters would like? Another question is, can you comment on the Oakland election about 10 years ago that was very controversial? And why was it so controversial? Mm -hmm. I'm somewhat familiar with this. I know it was a difficult uh, situation at the time also, but I think I'm going to hand this one over to Steve as your local expert. Yes. Um, the problem with that first Oakland election was that the uh, registrar in Alameda County did not want to run a preliminary ranked choice voting tally on election night. 
he wanted to wait until uh, more until all of the ballots had been run through the computer and and recorded. All the ballots had been scanned, including the absentee ballots that came in after election day. The the, the voter uh, absentee ballots that were dropped off on election day that hadn't been scanned yet. He, he just wanted to wait. And so all he had to report on election night was the first round results. The first round results showed uh, the leading candidate with 34% of the vote, a first choice rankings. The second place candidate had 25% of the vote and the rest were below that. So the newspaper stories Wednesday morning was that one candidate had an insurmountable nine point lead. When the actual tally was done and they started eliminating candidates from the bottom up, <clears throat> when they got to the last three candidates, um, the third place candidate uh, who was then eliminated, over three quarters of her voters had ranked the second place for the first round second place candidate as their next choice. <clears throat> So she ended up winning that, that second place finisher in the first round, ended up winning by about 1% of the vote. It was a very close election. <laughs> Excuse me. If the registrar had won, run a preliminary tally election night, it would have been known election night that the, that the vote was very close. And the main criticism against RCV that it takes a long time to know who the winner is, that really only applies to when elections are close. And I wanna to point to the example of when uh, Kamala Harris first ran for United States Senate in California. That election was so close, the leader between her and I forget who her opponent was, kept switching back and forth that the election was not called until three weeks after election day. And it was called for her but she refused to admit that she had won until for a, yet another week had passed when more of the provisional ballots had been tallied and it was clear that she was the winner. So whenever you have a close election, you're not gonna know on election night who won, whether it's ranked choice voting or a traditional vote for one election. Um, so that was the controversy uh, in, in Oakland uh, was that uh, the winner, they, all of a sudden that this, this nine vote margin disappeared and people wanted, well, how, how could that happen? And that's because of the way that they, they did the vote tally. Uh, later on, about six months into her term as mayor, she made a few mistakes uh, in her administration uh, and people were now upset with her. Uh, and the people who had supported the losing candidate blamed her election on ranked choice voting and said, if we had a traditional runoff system where we could have thrown mud at her in the very beginning, she would have never gotten elected. We, of course, don't know if that's true or not. But I will say this, when she did run for re-election, just as she was elected using ranked choice voting, she was defeated using ranked choice voting. So I hope that addresses that issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a, a minute for one more question. There's a argument that was heard that in the Alaska House race, Begich was somehow the preferred candidate, but because more people marked him second, uh, the argument doesn't make sense to the questioner because fewer people marked him first. But I hear this a lot as an argument against ranked choice voting in Alaska, and the questioner doesn't really understand it. All right, well, it's it's true that under first past the post, baggage also would have been eliminated. Um, so the question I believe is looking at uh, the cumulative effect of lower rankings and, uh, you know, perhaps finding a candidate that is, um, you know, I was going to say the word milk toast, which doesn't sound great, but you know, not necessarily one that anyone particularly prefers, but also is not the least disliked. So, if your criteria are that you want a candidate like that, um, that's where you may have cumulative votes or voting like approval voting. But under first, but if you do take preferences into account, if you think preferences matter, then. Begich would have lost regardless of first past the post or ranked choice voting. 
And do we have time for one more question on this part? Why do you think candidate later no harm is a more important element of a voting system than a system that does a better job of protecting the voters' interest by not having the need for them to game the system? Mm. Could you read that one again, please? I'm gonna to have to think about that one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting it correctly. Why do you think candidate later no harm is a more important element of a voting system than a system that does a better job of protecting the voters' interest by not having the need for them to game the system? It sounds like they're looking at how to game the system in ranked choice voting. Right, so later no harm is, the, is as I was saying, you, you cannot hurt your favorite by ranking another candidate lower. And this question about gaming the system, I guess that's where I'm not quite sure where they're coming from on that because there is no need to game the system. It's very difficult to game it with ranked choice voting. Hmm. And just one real quick one. Is there a plan to get ranked choice voting on the Santa Clara County ballot? It's currently being explored. Um, and of course it has to be approached very carefully and um, educate the city council and everyone about it, but that is in progress. And Steve, do you have breaking updates? Yes, uh, the voters in 1998 passed a, voters of Santa Clara County passed a charter amendment in 1998 um, that would allow the Board of Supervisors to change our elections to ranked choice voting. At the time, we did not have the voting equipment that could handle ranked choice voting. So the way Section 208 of the charter is worded, it says that the Board of Supervisors can authorize uh, what was then called instant runoff voting uh, once the county has the technology. Uh, the county does now have the technology, uh, and there was a uh, recommendation made by the Santa Clara County Citizens Advisory Commission on Elections, and full disclosure, I'm a member of that commission. Uh, we recommended that the Board of Supervisors consider implementing Section 208 and changing county elections um, to use ranked choice voting. And that is currently in front of the, uh, that recommendation is being considered by the Finance and Government Operations Committee of the Board of Supervisors. They had a, a first discussion of that back in January. Uh, they asked the registrar to come back with, well, what would it take to implement ranked choice voting? Uh, and she is supposed to give that report to the FGOC uh, sometime in November this coming month. Um, and then presumably at that point, it'll go to the full board. Um, and then they'll decide whether they want to implement it. It, uh, depending upon what they decide, it may or may not require another vote of the people. Because as I said, back in 1998, we authorized the Board of Supervisors by a vote of the people. We had a vote of the people to authorize the Board of Supervisors to make that decision. I hope right. that addresses the question. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, and also if I can add, um, the five leagues of women voters of Santa Clara County have a are supporting that recommendation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. And the League of Women Voters generally does have a favorable position on rate choice voting also. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I think now we'll dig into how this works, um, the mechanics of it, and then you'll have a chance to vote yourself. So let's uh, see if I can get back to my presentation here. There we go. All right, so this is really just a simple upgrade in the way we elect people. Rather than voting for one, you can vote for one. You can also mark your preference and a ballot typically would look something like this. So for each candidate that you would be comfortable being elected, you fill in your ballot in order of preference. If there are any candidates you do not want to see elected, you do not vote for them. It's that simple. So how do we count it? So how this works is in the first round, we count all the first choice votes, the same as we do under first past the post. 
and there is a threshold to reach. There must be over 50% of votes for someone for them to win. So here's a sample election with some purple people and orange people. And we counted the first choice votes. And do we have a winner? If you look, yes. Dark orange has 55% of the vote. We have a winner, we're done. If we have another election though, and the top vote getter gets 40% of the votes, it goes to another round. So the lightest orange with 5% can't win. They're the lowest vote getter. They're eliminated. And their voters next preference is shifted, is reallocated. So we have a round two. Do we have a winner? No. We do not. Highest vote getter is 44%. So it repeats. The lowest vote getter is eliminated. Their voters next preference is reallocated. And in round three, we have a winner. And that's how it works. We are all now going to be able to experience this ourselves. Steve will be running a mock election. So I will stop my share and let you take it from here, Steve. Uh, thank you, Celia. Uh, that, that was Steve, great. Before you begin, let me just reintroduce you so everybody knows your background. Uh, Steve is president of Californians for Electoral Reform and has been working on changing county elections to use ranked choice voting since 1998. He is also a member of the Santa Clara County Citizens Advisor Commission on Elections and a proud member of the League of Women Voters of Los Altos Mountain View. Steve is going to lead us through two simulations of ranked choice voting. When it's time to vote, he will explain how everyone be, will be able to access the ballot through the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. Steve, you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share what the ballot, uh, we're going to have a vote, uh, an election for your favorite suffragist. We winnowed the field. We had a nominating committee that came up with five nominees for this position. <laughs> um, and it, I believe you all received an email uh, yesterday that listed the nominees with links to their biography so that you could study the candidates and decide who was going to be your first choice, who was going to be your second choice, and so on. In a moment, I will put a uh, link in the chat to what your ballot, to your ballot, so you'll each be able to cast a vote. But before I do that, I wanted to show you what that ballot is going to look like and take you through the uh, process of, um, of how you're going to mark that ballot. So this is what the ballot will look like. Uh, who is your favorite suffragist? Um, there are the five nominees, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul, Lucretia Mott, Carrie Chapman Cat. The order will be different, may be different on your ballot. Um, I asked the uh, software to randomize the order of, of the candidates on each ballot, so not everyone is going to see them in the same order. But basically, <clears throat> you're going to select who is your first choice by clicking on that. And here on the right-hand side, you'll see where it will list your, the candidates that you've yet to rank and the candidates that you have ranked. And then maybe I might make Alice Paul my second choice and so on and so forth like that. Um, if I don't like a choice that I made, uh, I, I can uh, undo it or I can reset the entire ballot. And if I make a mistake, say I say, you know, I only like Carrie Chapman Cat, so I want to give her my first, second, third choice votes. That's an error. It does not help to give multiple rankings to the same candidate because if Carrie Chapman Cat is eliminated, and so she's no, so that, and so my ballot would again go to my second choice, but my second choice is also her and she's eliminated. So my ballot goes to my third choice, but that's also her and she's eliminated. So basically ranking the same candidate multiple times is basically throwing your vote away. Similarly, um, if I were to attempt to give the same ranking to two candidates, it's going to give me an error. And I can either reset the entire ballot or uh, unselect uh, the mistake that I made so that I can continue ranking the ballot. And then when I'm finished ranking the ballot and I like what I've got, 
I can then press the vote button and um, cast my ballot. And before I share the link, I wanted to know if there were any questions uh, at this point. And I don't see any questions coming up in the chat. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, stop the screen share. And I'm going to post a link to the ballot in the chat. I better go grab that link. Here's a copy button. There it is, copy. And now where's the chat? All right. So while the link is the same for everybody, the ballot everybody is going to get is going to be an individualized ballot. Uh, the question in the chat about if I don't choose a fifth candidate, then I lose the chance to affect the second round. No, that's not true. Um, what will happen is if your first four candidates are eliminated, we eliminate one candidate in each round until we have someone who has a majority. Uh, but if it goes all the way to, to all five rounds, um, yes, if, if your first four choices end up being eliminated, then your ballot won't count in the final round because you have not ranked a fifth choice. Oh, you want me to, someone wants me to simulate voting for only one candidate only as a first choice. Yeah, I will be happy to do that. Let me put my ballot back up. Uh, where did that go? Uh, I'm sharing the wrong thing. Let me try that again. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yes. Um, if I just want to rank one person, I just click one person and then I vote. So that's how you would vote for just one person. But if I only rank Elizabeth Cady Stanton as my first choice and she is eliminated, um, say she comes in last in the first round and is eliminated, I am not participating in the rest of the election. It's as if I did not bother to show up for the runoff election because I didn't like the candidates who have been left. So I'm disenfranchising myself by restricting myself to just one ranking. I hope that addresses the question. All right. Um, now I wanna give people an opportunity to vote. Um, let me see if I can. And if I may, oh, I'll turn my video on. If I may, I see a question in the chat that others might have also, which is if I don't choose a fifth candidate, then I lose the chance to affect the second round. Is that right? Yeah, I believe I addressed that question. But you did answer. I, I apologize. I was voting. No, no problem. No problem. <laughs> um, is there anybody who needs more time to vote? Please use the raise hand button in the reactions if you need more time to vote. Barbara, okay. I see a couple of people need more time to vote. Okay. Please lower your hand when you have voted. And maybe we'll give you... Um, I don't know, 30 more seconds. Well, I don't know. I don't I don't want to disenfranchise anybody. <laughs> because what we will do is after uh, everyone has voted, I'll close the polls and then I will walk you through the results. Oh, Barbara, you don't see a ballot. Uh, Barbara Lee, were you able to see the chat? I'll repost the link into the chat.
Mm. Uh, you need to click on the link in the chat to see the ballot. It'll pop up when you click on a link. It will open up in your browser. Now your browser may then, depending upon your software, you might have to bring your browser forward. And so it covers up your Zoom window. Uh, and then you'll have to be able, of course, get back to the, the Zoom window. So Barbara and Denise and Tom, do you see your ballots now? It is not in the chat. Maybe I'll do this as a direct message to Shirley. I'm sending you a direct message with a link it's to your ballot. It should, you should see the link in the chat. It's you not the ballot, it's the link. And if you click on that link, it will open in your browser a ballot, whether you use Firefox or Safari or whatever the, or Chrome or whatever the Microsoft browser is called. It should open up in your bow, uh, in your browser. Okay, Barbara, I'm going to lower your hand then since you voted. Barbara Lee, I'm going to lower your hand. Barbara Wardenberg, are you still having difficulty? Uh, your hand is down. All right. All right, I'm going to wait another 30 seconds in case there's any laggards out there, but at 1049 by my clock, I'm going to be closing the polls, and then I'll be displaying the results. So I've got to go to my dashboard. And in, <coughs> in five more seconds, just like we do on election night. The polls are now closed. The polls are now closed. All right. And now I'm going to bring up the uh, results. Okay, I want to get this. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen again. And that should be the right one. Now we're going to take this one at a time. And in the first round, we see that Alice Paul is in the lead with 17 votes. But it's, there were um, <clears throat> 19 votes are needed to win. Um, let me just double check something. Oops, wrong. there we go. Um, yeah, because we had uh, 30, I guess we had uh, 37 votes, voters. Um, okay, so Alice Paul has, has 17, so she's in the lead. Susan B. Anthony has eight. Elizabeth Cady Statton has six. Carrie Chapman has five. Lucretia Mott has won. So we do not have a majority winner. So we're going to eliminate the person who came in last, which is Lucretia Mott. Uh, and whoever voted for her as their first choice will have their ballot transferred to their second choice. And that went to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So she now has seven. We still don't have a majority winner. So now we're going to eliminate the person who's now in last place, Carrie Chapman Cat who has five votes, and they're gonna get distributed to each of those voters' respective second choices. So we'll go to round three, and looks like two of those ballots went to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and three of those ballots went to Susan B. Anthony. All right, well, we still don't have a majority winner. Uh, so now we eliminate the person who came in last, which is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and, <clears throat> Those ballots will get redistributed. Now, the people who ranked Elizabeth Cady Stanton first, their ballots will go to their second choice. But those who transferred to her because she was ranked second on their ballot, they will go to their third choice. And these two voters 
uh, we'll have them possibly, well, no, I take it back. They'll also go to their second choice, but they could go to the third choice. Wow. And after four rounds, they all went to Susan B. Anthony. So she is the winner after four rounds uh, by getting 20 votes. So I, I, uh, it had showed when I did, unfortunately, I didn't want to spoil it by showing even after that the software told me who the winner was going to be. So I thought <laughs> I did that. Um, so it requires a candidate's 50% support. The first step is we count all first choice votes. If no one reaches 50% of first choice, then the lowest candidate is eliminated and those votes shift to second or later choices. We continue that round by round until the candidate reaches 50% and wins. And I'm now gonna post in the chat, the link to this page, so you can play with displaying the results yourself. I'm gonna stop my screen share and I'm going to go get that link. Um, copy that link and I'm gonna post that into the chat. Send that to everyone. Okay, so if you click on that link or uh, copy and paste it someplace else and link, I, like I won't delete this, this election for at least a week. So you can play with the slider up and down and, and, and see for yourself how the, uh, the votes transfer. Um, you know, I'd be happy to take any questions. And if not, I'm gonna turn it back to, to Celia who's gonna take us through the multi-winner form uh, of ranked choice voting. <clears throat> Celia, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you. So thank you, Steve. It's very interesting to see the results of that. Yeah. Um, so we have, so as I said at the beginning, we're looking for fair representation in our government. So we've talked about how to do that when there is a single winner in office. We find a consensus winner that represents the true majority of the people. Um, so that's a good system for single winner. But what about when we are electing more than one person at a time. This could be our city council, our state legislature, school committees, Congress, um, any number of bodies where we elect more than one at a time. So that is multi-winner RCV with proportional representation. And you may also, some political scientists call it the single transferable vote. Transferable vote. So that is what we're talking about. If I slip into that, it's the same thing. So why would we need to change the way that we, we do things now? Let's say we have an at-large jurisdiction. We're gonna elect three people. And so each person gets three votes because there are three people to win this election. This is how my town does it. Um, possibly many of you use this also. And this pie represents the electorate in this large jurisdiction. Um, it's fairly evenly split, but if you look, that light green is a little bit bigger slice of the pie. So they are the plurality. And so that plurality with each of their votes is able to choose the winner. So our three winners come from that same voting block. And this is also called block voting. So let's try to remedy that. We could split those voters up and put them in three small districts and each district elects a winner. So we still get three winners from this area. So let's look at our voters. It's the same sort of distribution. So again, in each of these districts, light green is gonna have more votes under plurality. And once again, we have three light green winners. So the legislature could try to redraw these districts and make the lines so that you can try to represent the people there, but anytime that we're trying to draw districts, the question becomes who is drawing the lines? You know, is this a reasonable way to, um, to form the district? What happens over time as it changes? So it's a very tricky subject to try to fix this 
with district lines. So if we go back to that large at large district, we're back with our electorate here, but now we're gonna choose three proportional winners. We'll go into the mechanism momentarily, but as you'll see, it considers all the votes and transfers them so that each of these large voting constituencies gets their winner. Hmm. So really this, um, this prevents one group of voters from really pooling their strength and making the decisions for the rest of the people who are not represented by our winners. So I'll pause there after that concept and see if we have any questions at this point. Or there, if we- There is a question. Uh, for, <clears throat> are there models that don't use the 50% as a threshold, but instead run all votes to the last two? Uh, so, so I see, so just look to the last two. So this sounds like a reducing, this sounds like counting in rounds and reducing. What it is, and I answered it in the chat. Um, we actually recommend running the tally to the last two candidates in public elections uh, because someone, the, the example I like to give is, let's say uh, in, in the, when you, uh, a majority winner is declared when someone has 51% of the vote and there's two other candidates left and the one candidate has 25% of the vote and the other candidate has 24% of the vote. So we don't know, uh, well, obviously A got 51% of the vote, they're the winner, but we don't know if it's A versus B with 51 to 49 or if it's A versus B with <clears throat> 75 versus 25 because B got 25% of the vote and C got 24% of the vote in that last round. So we recommend actually in real public elections to find out what the winner's true mandate is. Well, let's go to the last two, let's eliminate C and see where those votes transfer uh, because it may be that B and C were very closely aligned and most of C supporters supported B. And so A ends up winning 51A to 49B. So A has a very weak mandate. Or it may be that most of the C supporters really preferred A over B. And so and A will have a much stronger. And so if we eliminate C and carry the tally's last two votes, uh, last to so the last two candidates, that we end up with A beating B by 75 to 25, then A has a much stronger mandate because the B, the C voters were much more closely aligned to A than they were to B. But it doesn't change who wins. Mathematically, whoever gets over 50% of the vote in a given round is going to be the winner, but we do recommend in real elections carrying the tally to the last two candidates to see what their true mandate is. Yep. Thank you, Steve. And I should say that was a description for a single winner, but the same is true for multi-winner to reduce to really show uh, what the percentage was for each candidate. Okay. All right, are we ready to jump into how this works? Yes. All right. So really, it's very similar to the single winner ranked choice voting that you have already experienced. So we're going to elect three seats, but proportionally ranked choice voting this time. Your voter experience is going to be exactly the same. You have your ballot with the options, you rank them and you know that you can never harm any candidate by ranking them, you cannot harm your favorite. So on the voter side, it's exactly the same. Now, if there's one winner, as we've said, you need to get over 50% to win. For multiple winner, that threshold is lower. So this is how you get voting blocks that may be substantial, but don't have a majority or even a plurality as we saw, but are large enough uh, that it would be uh, it would be fair representation for them to be in. So the winning threshold is lower, which depends on the number of seats to fill, is the usual way we do it. And that is the droop quota, which we mentioned in our history. And so eliminations work the same as for single winner ranked choice voting, but there is one more step. And this is J.B. Gregory's contribution, which is that as there are extra votes that are above that threshold to win, those extra votes are real, reallocated proportionately 
to that candidate's voters next preference. So I'm going to show how that works, but just briefly talk about why we would do that. So I'm going to give you a theoretical example, which is Dolly Parton moves to Santa Clara and she wants to run for the city council. There are four seats that are up in 2024. I think this is correct information. I looked it up. So the votes are counted and Dolly Parton is so popular, she gets 90% of the vote. So she wins, she has a seat. If we don't consider those ballots in excess of what she needed to win, that means there are 10% of voters who would decide the remaining three seats. Does that really reflect how people would have chosen those four seats? Probably not. So this proportional reallocation is how we balance things out and really consider all the voters. So let's do this three-person election. So here's our round one, and you can see that dashed line is that winning percentage that uh, needs to be achieved to win. Do we have any winners? Yes. We have two. So we need to find our third winner though. So if this were a single winner election, we'd just eliminate the bottom vote getter, right? But first we have this reallocation step. So above the threshold needed to win, the yellow candidates votes are allocated. They mostly went over to orange. So that number of ballots in the proportion how they voted are reallocated. And the same for the purple voters. And it looks like they were about evenly distributed between the, the teal and the orange. So do we have our third winner? We do not. So now we do ranked choice voting. The bottom vote getter is eliminated. Their votes are reallocated to their voters next preference. And we have our winner. Mm -hmm. And now you all can experience that too, and you'll see your ballot will function exactly the same. Just the calculation has that one extra step on the back end. And Steve, if you're ready, you can take us to the next election. Yes, I was just answering a question in the chat. <laughs> uh, but now that I've done that, I can now... Um share what the ballot's going to look like. Let's see if this is working. Yes. Okay. So this is the, um, the eight nominees of which we're going to elect three uh, that will proportionally reflect the, uh, the preferences of the people participating in this meeting. The ballot looks very similar, except you have eight choices, eight candidates and eight rankings. But again, you're going to do the same thing of just ranking them. The voter experience is identical to before. If you make a mistake, it's going to warn you. Uh, and if you make a different kind of a mistake, uh, it's going to tell you about that as well. Um, so if there are no questions, I'm going to put this link into the chat. Uh, let me see here, go back to everyone. And if you click on the link in the chat, it should open up that ballot for you. And I guess um, since you are all old hands now at ranking ballots, we'll uh, give you about a minute to vote.
Okay, does anybody need more time to vote? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll ask again in another minute. Does anybody still need more time? You know, raise your virtual hand if you need more time. Okay, seeing none, I'll give it 30 more seconds before we close the polls. I've got to go to my dashboard. All right, the polls are closing. The polls are now closed. All right, and now I'm going to uh, get the results. Takes a bit to load. Okay. And I'm going to take us through the uh, round by round and I'm going to hide who it declares the winners are. Okay. Um, and I think I'm ready to share my screen now. Actually, before I do that, I want to make, check one, one thing. Say how many voters we had. Doesn't. Oh, okay. We had 30. We had 37 people vote in the first election. We had 34 people vote in this election. Okay, I wanted to get that before. I just I share the results. Okay. All right. Wow. Uh, we had 34 uh, voters. We were electing three winners. So the, um, we have to do a little bit of math. Uh, we take 34 and we divide it by one more than the number of seats. That's four. So it would take nine votes to win, to be elected. We sort the ballots out by first choice. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
got 13 votes. So she is clearly elected. Eleanor Roosevelt got 12 votes. So she is clearly elected. But no other candidates got of that threshold. So we only have two candidates win winning. And so as not to disenfranchise the people who voted for Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Eleanor Roosevelt, um, because the way I like to explain this is if that suppose Ruth Bader Ginsburg had gotten twice as many votes as she needed to win. Um, well, the people who voted for her could have gotten into a room beforehand and say, hey, we have twice as many people as are needed to elect somebody. So why don't half of you go vote for somebody else uh, and make that person a winner? Because we our group can elect two people. Um, but since we don't have the ability in real elections to get in a room and decide that, by by transferring a, a, in a proportional fashion the second choice, that allows that same group of people to elect their the amount of representation they're entitled to. So the first thing we are going to do is, since Ruth Bader Ginsburg got over the threshold, she got um, about four more votes than she needed to win. We're going to take a fraction of each vote that she got. So she ends up with a net of nine, but we're going to take a fraction of what she got and that's that fraction. And we're gonna distribute those to their next choice. Um, and we're gonna do the same thing for Eleanor Roosevelt's excess votes, distribute them to the next choice. Um, okay, actually, while it shows them grayed out here, this is the distribution of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg excess surplus votes. And when we distribute Eleanor Roosevelt's surplus votes, that they, they shows up in this lighter color purple. We still have no third winner. So now we do what we do in a single winner election. Uh, we're going to take the candidate who came in fewest, it came in last, which is Barbara Lee, and we're going to transfer all of those votes that she received, fractional or otherwise, to the respective next choice on those ballots. So those went to Harriet Tubman. She increased. Uh, wow. Again, we still have no winner, third winner. So Sojourner Truth is the next one to be eliminated. Those also all went to Harriet Tubman. Uh, Margaret Sanger is now in last place. So we eliminate her. And some of those votes transferred to Harriet Tubman. And some went to Betty Friedan. Uh, but now we see that Michelle Obama is in last place. So we eliminate Michelle Obama. And those votes wow. get transferred um, slightly more to Harriet Tubman than to Betty Friedan. Neither candidate has made it to the threshold, but because we had inactive ballots, we take whoever had the most votes in that last round, we would eliminate Betty Friedan. It doesn't show that in the slider. That's I have to talk to the people who developed this web page about that because we really should be eliminating Betty Friedan at this point. Um, and that would show that Harriet Tubman would definitely be over the threshold and would be the winner. So those are our three winners who proportionally represent the group, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Harriet Tubman. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna share that uh, link to the results in the chat so people can click on that link uh, at their leisure and, and, and walk through the slider uh, themselves uh, to see how that works. All right. And if there uh, aren't any questions, I'm going to turn that back over to, uh, to Celia. And in fact, that was the end of my presentation too. So thank you, Steve, for your teamwork um, and explaining these concepts we have, as I said, many examples and statistics. If anyone would like to know more, I put my email in the chat. I would love to hear from all of you, from any of you, if you have questions or any further requests. Um, so if we have extra time, perhaps we could take uh, more questions, but I'll, Eleanor, I will let you take it from here. Yes, I think we do have a few more minutes. Uh, we have a couple of more questions in the chat. And uh, Marie-Anne and Lois, if you could just uh, select the ones that you want to present. Uh, there's a couple questions. <clears throat> one of them is, um, the one of the participants may have missed it, but when you reallocated Ruth Bader Ginsburg's votes down, 
how did you decide who's to downvote? Okay, that's, um, let me bring up that, um, share the screen again. Yeah, and okay. an accessory question to that is, when you are reallocating the votes to the other potential winners, are you using the way that those people voted on their ballot to reallocate those votes? Well, the answer to that is definitely yes. Uh, we um, we use the, the the votes that that people that people ranked. Okay, now let me. Uh, okay, I've got the screen I want to share, so let me share that. Okay. All right. So this is at I mean, the first round, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg got uh, was it uh, four more votes more than yes. she needed to win. Okay. Now Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the original early implementations of single transferable vote, which is the political science term for this system, uh, the original implementations that uh, Celia talked about uh, before. Um, Mr. Gregory came along. They would just pick four votes, four ballots at random, and say, "We'll take four. We'll pick four people at random, take their ballots, and give them the second choice." And if you understand statistics and believe in the in the law of large numbers, you can see how for for very large elections like the ones in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they have twenty thousand voters, that that can work. But there's a fairer method of doing that, which takes everybody's vote in the consideration. Um, now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg received four more votes than she needed. She got a total of 13 votes. So what we do is we take four divided by 13, which is about 0.3. And we take everybody who voted for Ruth Bader Ginsburg she gets to keep 0.7 of their vote. It's as if, um, well, the, the way I like to do this when I talk about STV, I say, if this is your vote, this is your ballot, and you voted for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she didn't need all your vote. She only needed 70% of your vote. So we're going to take the other 30% of your vote and give it to your second choice. So everybody's vote, when we go to that reallocation, these represent, uh, this is probably one person's 30%. This, these small ones are probably each a single vote, 30% of a single vote. This looks like it might be two or three. Uh, and this looks like it would be the rest of it. Um, so everybody's vote, everybody who voted for Ruth Bader Ginsburg has their vote transferred uh, a proportion, a fraction of their vote transferred. That's why we call it fractional transfer. And we believe this is the fairest system. Similarly, when Eleanor Roosevelt's excess of three ballots gets transferred, she got 12 votes and three over 12 is 25, 0.25. So everybody who voted for Eleanor Roosevelt, um, she gets to keep 75% of their vote and a quarter of their vote goes to their next choice. And that's this lighter purple here, showing how those votes transferred. It's a very sophisticated concept. And um, as I, it's a very sophisticated concept, uh, but I want to stress that the voters experience in terms of ranking their ballot, they don't have to think about what part of my vote is going to go to my next choice if my first choice uh, gets more votes than they need. They don't have to think about that. They just know that they rank their their ballot in, in order of preference. And it's the same experience for the voter in multi-winner ranked choice voting as it is in single winner ranked choice voting. Huh. Yeah, Lois asked that if I taken four other votes to redistribute, it could have a different results. Yeah, that's one of the problems with, with random transfer. Uh, the way I like to say that is, um, so, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts elects uh, a nine-member city council. So the threshold of election with nine, with nine seats is 10%. And let's say 30% uh, or a third of the voters vote for candidates with yellow eyes. And there happen to be four candidates with yellow eyes. And they all rank those four candidates first on their ballots. 
Well, if they're a third of the voters, they should, by rights, they should be able to elect three of those seats. And three of the winners will have yellow eyes. If you do random transfer, then which of those th three of those four people get elected could be different depending upon the way the rant works. But you will still elect three people with yellow eyes because that's what that group decided. A third of the people wanted candidates with yellow eyes to get elected. So the results are still proportional, but the actual winner who fulfills that proportionality requirement might be different. And that's okay. For, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts has been doing that this since the 1940s, and they see no, they've seen no reason to change from random transfer to, to fractional transfer. But where we are implementing uh, proportional ranked choice funding, such as the city of Albany, which will be using it for the very first time this November, they will be using fractional transfer. Uh, the city of Palm Desert, which will also be using proportional representation to uh, fill two city council seats. They'll be using fractional transfer as well. And Thank in terms you. of lowest winners votes, uh, when we get to the point where we have to distribute the lowest vote getter, those votes go at their full value, whatever they happen to be. So if I can reshare my screen. Okay, uh, you note that that uh, Barbara Lee originally got no votes. She only picked up votes when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was eliminated. So she got a ballot here that is, has a value of 0 0.30. So when we get around four, where we're going to eliminate Barbara Lee, her ballot, the ballot that she has, the vote that she has, has a value of 0 0.3. It goes to Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman gets another 0 0.3 added to her vote total. So those ballots get transferred at their full value. There's no more additional fractionation being done to these ballots mm -hmm. as they get transferred. Some ballots have a full value of one. Some ballots that get transferred have a fractional value because that's how they ended up on Sojourner Truth. That makes it a very sophisticated system. And it results in the, as Celia showed in that slide with the, uh, the three, the three segments, um, each third of the electorate got to elect someone who represented them. Hmm. Great. Marianne, I see one more question. Um, someone commented, if I were voting in the current system, I would vote for three. So I want my second and third choice to count. It does in this approach. Well, suppose your first three choices were so unpopular that nobody else voted there for them and they all got eliminated. Yeah. Mm. Then you then you're basically saying, oh, I, I didn't I don't care about the rest. I just wanted one of my first three to win. And if they, if they can't win, then um, then I don't care who gets elected. I mean, that's a perfectly valid position to take. But you're only hurting yourself by not saying asking yourself, well, if my first three choices can't win, who would I want to see represent me? Mm. I better have a fourth choice and a fifth choice and a sixth choice for okay. as many choices as I care about or as the equipment will let me um, will let me rank. The Dominion equipment that the county has allows up to 10 rankings. Mm. Uh, and mm -hmm. since we ra very rarely have more than 10 candidates in any kind of an election in Santa Clara County um, for county offices, um, that should be more than enough so mm. that people can rank all of the candidates. You know, one of the questions did um, uh, apply to that. It said, is there, are there many different software programs available to do these calculations? And is one considered a gold standard over the others? Uh, I wouldn't say that there's one uh, gold standard. Uh, I was looking for one. I had, I had four criteria. It had to be free. <laughs> Okay. Um, it had to use a grid format because that's what the Dominion equipment has. Okay. Um, um, it had to, um, I can't remember, one of my criteria was that it, it had to be able to display round by round results in okay. an easily understandable fashion. Okay. Um, and what was my fourth criteria? Oh yeah, it could let you rank as many candidates as are on the ballot. <clears throat> and one that I considered limited you to five rankings. 
and we had an election with eight candidates. So I, I didn't want to use that. So I, I ended up with rcv123.org. Mm -hmm. And I'll put that in the chat. Great. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that I used. Um, but there are others out there. Uh, <clears throat> some of them, uh, basically, you order a list of candidates instead of using a grid format. And that may be conceptually easier to use for mm -hmm. voting. Mm -hmm. um, and as a matter of fact, if you uh, do rank choice voting in uh, Alameda or um, San Francisco counties mm -hmm. and you use the ballot marking device, mm -hmm. that's the format the ballot marking device uses. I see. You'll see a list of, the, the, uh, of candidates and you select your first choice, the number one shows up on it. You select your second, the number two shows up next to it. So it doesn't use a grid for the voter's experience, but mm -hmm. the paper ballot does use a grid. Okay. Um, someone asked about um, the paper ballot. How are errors corrected if the voter uses a paper ballot? Well, that is one of the issues <clears throat> um, that if you incorrectly mark a paper ballot um, and if you mail it in as opposed to scanning it in, if you scan it in, the scanners will detect that you've made a, an error and will ask you if you want to correct the error. If you mail it in, of course, there is no opportunity for that correction. But uh, we've studies have been done that show that the, uh, the, the voter error rate uh, in ranking, uh, casting a ranked ballot is, is no greater than that in a traditional vote for one election where people sometimes vote for two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we'll go to our last question now, which is uh, maybe both of you could respond to this. With the current controversies around elections, how do you see implementing a new system happening? And maybe uh, Celia, you could take more of a national approach and Steve, maybe a more local approach to responding to that question. So Celia? Sure, so as we've talked about, there have been more and more implementations. So this is something that's been happening with some regularity um, and it has gone smoothly as we have people who are familiar with how to do it can advise on it but really a key part of that is voter education 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 so they understand what is happening and also transparency and reporting the results uh -huh. um, and in some cases uh, you know the ballot data does need to be brought to a single location and if it is a close election, um, it's not the full ballot machines, and there is a secure way of doing that. So again, it's making sure that voters know what the process is and have confidence in the system and know exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Steve? Yeah, well, we are basically taking a, a, a slow approach. I mean, there are people who would like to see us use ranked choice voting statewide um, uh, instead of the current top two system. Um, Alaska adopted what's called, uh, I believe it's final four, or, um, where they do have a primary election where people just vote for one person and then the top four vote getters go into a ranked choice voting oh, uh, runoff election. Mm. Uh, and that eliminates uh, some of the issues we've seen in, in with top two, where you might have a, a district that is, uh, uh, say a Republican district, majority Republican district, but because the Republicans, there are so many Republican candidates on that primary ballot and only two Democrats on the primary ballot, that the Republican party split, Republican voters split their votes among those Republican candidates so many ways that the top two finishers end up being both Democrats. And that's <laughs> all you get to elect. And, the, and we've seen the reverse in, in Democratic districts where the top two in the runoff are, are both Republican. Right. Final five or final four seems to help uh, eliminate that. Uh -huh. um, but there are issues uh, with doing it in statewide elections. Our, our elections are administered on a county basis. And if you have a jurisdiction that crosses county lines, um, you do have to make sure that the voters in both parts of the district and say a, count, a district is split into different counties, that they both are entitled to rank the same number of candidates. You can't have equipment in one county that limit that limits you to three rankings and equipment in another county that lets you rank all six candidates that are on the ballot. That uh -huh. would not be fair. Uh 
Mm -hmm. uh, then there's also the issue of, well, how do you do the tally? How do you get the cast voter records from one county into the other county? Because with ranked choice voting, um, it's, it's not what they call precinct summable as first past the post is, where you can just do a tally within each precinct and then take yeah. those totals and add them all up. You really need to, you could do what they do in, um, uh, in the Republic of Ireland, where they do their county on, uh, they're counting on what's considered a, well, they don't call them congressional districts, but it's, it's similar. They, they have uh, what we would call congressional districts and they do their vote tallying in that, in that, um, in that fashion. And they use ranked choice voting to elect their president. And so what they do is in each tallying location, they tally the first choices and they call them in to a central location, which adds up the first choices, figures out who came in last, calls back to each of those tallying locations, say, okay, eliminate, eliminate John Doe mm. and, and now run the tally and tell mm. us who, and do your second round and call us back with those numbers. Okay. And they do that and they call back with the second round numbers and they repeat that process. So that's another way of handling the cross-jurisdiction mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. That's one way. And the other way is what they do in Maine and presumably in Alaska, where they bring all the, uh, if not the actual ballots themselves, a scanned image of the ballots to a central tallying location, which mm -hmm. then runs the ranked choice voting tally. So two different Thank you so much, um, both Steve and Celia. You know, just a general question to our audience is that, uh, that I find interesting. It says, does the LWV use ranked choice voting for board elections? And I don't know if anybody on the uh, Zoom call here knows that or not, but I'd be interested in knowing it and uh, having a discussion about it, that would be very interesting. Um, but again, uh, we're right on time here. It's just a little bit after 1130. And I do want to ch thank our two speakers today, our two uh, instructors today. I learned a lot about ranked choice voting. I think for the first time, I understand the fractional part that I did not understand before. I was so impressed, Celia, with all the information that you gave us about uh, kind of the development of different kinds of voting uh, throughout the years, and in particular, seeing where it is uh, being implemented across the United States in various elections. So I learned a lot, and that gave me a really good perspective on it. So again, thank you for your expert uh, presentation and information, Celia and Steve. Let's everybody give them a great big hand. Um, and I think our charge as league members and guests today is to help spread information about ranked choice voting. And of course, don't forget, Election Day is coming up November 8th. And thank you to our planning team. Planning should be corrected, I-N-G. So from the League of Women Voters, Cupertino, Sunnyvale, Roberta, and Marianne, and from my league, Sophia, Lois, and myself. So again, thank you so much. Thank you to our participants. And thank you to everybody who submitted questions. And we will be saving those questions from the chat. And uh, we'll be looking at some of them and providing some answers. So thank you very much again, both Celia and Steve. Thank you. And that ends our presentation. Good night. Good day. Save chat. Sophia.